Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this morning we have with us Scott Long, the Executive Director of Operations at the Alberta Emergency Management Agency, and Chad Morrison, a Senior Wildfire Manager, just to say a couple of words about the reentry and the fire situation. I think we'll start with Chad. Thank you, Katrina. Uh, Chad Morrison, uh, Senior Manager with Alberta Wildfire. So just a brief update on the fire. The fire is currently uh, still at uh, 508,000 hectares in size and still classified it out of control at this time, but there is still no imminent threat to the community or surrounding areas. The fire saw scattered showers on it yesterday, which actually helped out uh, reducing some of the smoke. Uh, we saw anywhere from 2 millimetres of rain up to 20 to 30 millimetres in some places. Uh, we still have just over 1,900 firefighters on scene, over 75 helicopters, and over 200 pieces of heavy equipment and dozers on scene. That we saw no, we continue to see no growth in the fire yesterday, uh, and also it continues to burn in the remote areas away from the community. Uh, one of the primary concerns uh, that we want to talk about today is, uh, as moving forward, we want to ensure firefighters can continue to work safely in the areas in and around the fire. Uh, recently, we had a re report, and we also want to remind people as well that uh, the area around the fire is also still a restricted airspace. Um, and this applies to all aircraft, including drones. So we had a recent report uh, from uh, today that there was uh, some unauthorized flying in the area. So the point I wanted to, point to talk about here is that drones can endanger first responders. They can impede progress in the wildfire as well. Uh, they can lead to significant fines of up to $25,000. So while the fire continues to no longer be an imminent threat uh, to the community, we want to just continue to ask folks and remind people that uh, the fire is still classified out of control and it's an active fire area with active fire, uh, sorry, with active fire suppression ongoing. Um, so we just want to ensure that our first responders still remain safe as they continue to do their work uh, through the coming days and weeks ahead. Uh, thanks very much. And with that, I'll turn it over to Scott. <coughs> Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Scott Long, Executive Director of Operations, Alberta Emergency Management Agency. Uh, we're here today to update you with the uh, latest on the Fort McMurray reentry process. So I'm pleased to report that the voluntary phased re-entry uh, of residents went very smoothly yesterday. We estimate uh, that more than 8,000 people arrived safely of the estimated 13,000 that were eligible to return. Traffic yesterday was lighter than we expected and nearly 5,000 uh, vehicles traveled northbound on Highway 63 and Highway 881. We did note that there was a sharp increase in the early morning as people were very keen to get home. However, that tapered off and picked up, and again picked up later in the uh, afternoon. This morning, it looks like traffic volumes have at least doubled from what uh, we were seeing yesterday. And as at 10 a.m., we have seen approximately just over 2,000 vehicles on the highways moving north. Uh, the flow of traffic is reported to be smooth, and there's no issues or tickets that have been issued. Uh, our priority is to ensure residents get back to town safely. We have ambulances and steers, STARS air ambulance on standby. We continue to monitor traffic in real time, and we have transportation officials along the routes to ensure safe travel. Red Cross, bu uh, Red Cross bus service continues today. There were three buses that were departing from Edmonton, and one departed from Calgary with uh, approximately 180 people, and pets are being accommodated on these buses. People, if they have questions or concerns about traffic safety, or traffic movement, people should fo uh, phone uh, five or sorry, use 511 Alberta to get the latest highway info. Today, we expect uh, 40,000 people are, are sorry. Today, 40,000 people are eligible to, re to voluntarily re return to Zone Two, based on traffic flow uh, so far this morning and what we saw yesterday. We expect approximately 20,000 people uh, will come back voluntarily, come back to their community today. The current re-entry schedule is as follows. As a reminder, yesterday was Zone 1. Uh, today, Zone 2, Parsons Creek, Stone Creek, Timberley, Eagle Ridge, and Dickensfield. Friday is Zone 3, Thickwood and Wood Buffalo. Saturday, Zone 4, Alpha, Gregoire, Prairie Creek, and Saprate Creek Estates. And Saturday, Zone 4, Bravo, Grayling Terrace, and Draper. Uh, the dates may change to ensure a safe return to your community, and in this event, we are committed to communicate any changes to the, uh, uh, to the uh, uh, citizens of Fort McMurray as quickly as possible. Uh, every day, as a reminder, we continue uh, to review the re-entry conditions for the following day, and I'm pleased to say 
uh, that uh, clearly the uh, re-entry uh, uh, conditions are, were all green, and that's why we have people moving today. Uh, as you know, in accordance with the CMO, uh, the Chief Medical Officer's recommendations, homes in Abyssin, waterways, and Beacon Hills cannot be permanently occupied until debris has been removed. Plans to view those areas are being confirmed, and once confirmed, information will be posted on the regional municipal website, and we expect that within the next 24 to 40 hour, uh, 24 hours. Sorry. Attack of fire work was completed in waterways and is about 35% complete in Abyssans. We expect that work to begin in Beacon Hills sometime today. Echo Gas relit more than 1,000 homes yesterday, uh, and they actually have people roving through those communities. So as they see people actually moving in, uh, they've been pretty close or pretty quick on the spot to activate the gas uh, uh, appliances within the homes. There are seven information centers in uh, uh, seven. Uh, sorry, sorry. There are seven information centers uh, in six Fort McMurray neighborhoods, one in Anzac, and one at the Nishta Woyu uh, Friendship Center. Nearly 5,000 people visited information centers and about 850 insurance adjusters were in the affected areas yesterday, with more coming later this week. The Northern Lights Regional Health Center opened at 8 a.m. yesterday with limited emergency room service available 24 and 7. And as a reminder, this is, of course, augmented by the uh, urgent care center. Work is underway to restore other areas of the hospital as quickly as possible, and we are still on time for the 21 June uh, date. Uh, two fixed-wing aircraft and one helicopter are in place, staffed by eight air ambulance crew members to transfer patients if required. Uh, and to date, no medevacs have been required. Uh, Mobile Urgent Care Center will remain in place to provide basic health services and enhance capacity. Uh, no spike in patient volume with re-entry was recorded. There were 34 patients seen yesterday. More than 100 mental health workers are in the community. Ten mental health workers from BC arrived yesterday to augment that, uh, the staff, and mental health workers are at all information centers. Further, they are also roving in the communities to provide support to residents returning home. The general pharmacy services are available in the cities as well as the grocery stores and gas stations, and we continue to see small businesses opening daily. Uh, people should call uh, 811 for any health information that they may require. Uh, support to evacuees, debit cards, there were 38,409 distributed to help about 78,000 people. Uh, uh, with more than uh, $81 million. Uh, and in conclusion, I just want to say the POC, uh, in close collaboration with the regional authorities, remained focused on the safe reentry of uh, residents uh, on day two of reentry. Thank you. Are there any questions? Great. Uh, we'll just open the floor to questions off and then take some callers. Thanks. Scott, what can people expect when they go back to Fort McMurray as far as getting around with vehicles, uh, traffic management, is a free flow everywhere? Well, it's, uh, it's clearly not going to be free flow. The traffic lights are all working, uh, but clearly there are uh, RCMP, enhanced presence, uh, private security. There's only one area where there will be access control, and that is the waterways, Beacon, Beacon Hills, and Abyssin's area. Uh, but other than that, uh, all of the information centers are open in all of the zones, so they can go to any information zone, whether it's zone two today or not, just to make sure we don't have a big lineup at the one. Uh, but uh, obey the rules of the law and uh, uh, traffic uh, um, uh, rules, and uh, th the community is open. They're welcoming everybody back, for, with the exception of that one area. Okay, Chad, I have a question for you, if you don't mind. Um, you say that 508,000 hectares is burned, correct? Oh, sorry, 580,000. 580,000. How much of that is actively on fire? Because I understand that it's on fire or already burned. Yeah, so you're a good question. Much of it isn't on fire anymore. Much of that's burnt out. There'll be some, uh, you know, it's burning much in the perimeters out away from the community, uh, out to the north and the northeast uh, there. Um, we, were, was, we were there yesterday. You know, uh, you can't see any visible smoke in and around the community at all. Uh, we're going to have some warm weather over the weekend, so we may see the odd one pop up, but there's firefighters in place to, to respond to those. So at this point, yeah, much of the fire is out in the interior. It's just the exterior out in the remote forested areas. Uh, I don't have the exact sort of numbers and details, but very much along the perimeter there. And we've actually contained uh, almost 48% uh, of that perimeter now. So uh, much of that, even that perimeter is out. And, and uh, so we're actually uh, making very, very good progress with firefighters there. So. 
Uh, maybe we'll go to the phones operator, put through our first caller. Your first question comes from the line of Chris Vandenbrinkel from Mix 1037. Your line is open. Hi there. Uh, my question is for uh, Scott Long here. Uh, just in terms of uh, re-entry into, uh, into some of the damaged areas, you said that some of the timelines may be delayed. Are you looking at the damaged neighborhoods like Stone Creek or Wood Buffalo in that sense? Uh, no, sir. The, uh, the uh, Stone Creek is on time. The tack of fire uh, was laid down in the uh, area of that community that was burned. Uh, and that is actually the, our biggest concern is to make sure the tack of fire is in place uh, and uh, specifically waterways, Beacon Hills and Abbasands, as you uh, heard me, me just brief, a lot of progress has been made there. Uh, but the only way we would delay a re-entry into those specific areas is if the tack of fire was not down. Right now, uh, there is a potential that it could be delayed by one or two days based on the progress of the TACA fire. Once that decision is uh, made, we will communicate that out to uh, those residents as quick as possible. That is, again, Abbasan's Waterways, and Beacon Hills. Uh, the other communities as part of Zone 4 Bravo and 4 Alpha are not impacted. Okay, and uh, just to follow up to that, if uh, environmental tests come back and they show that there has been the presence of uh, these heavy metals in those areas that have not been blocked off to reentry for the existing homes, will those areas be evacuated again? Uh, right now, we've put tack of fire down in every zone, on every house that's been, uh, as, uh, that's been impacted by damage, destroyed by it. Um, and that is a, that's positive safety. Uh, uh, because, again, we're not going to bring people back to an unsafe environment. Uh, to answer your question, we readdress the re-entry conditions every day. If something comes up that impacts on public safety, we will absolutely de delay, uh, address it and delay the re-entry process. Great. Operator, if you'll put through our next call, thank you. Your next question comes from the line of John Cotter from the Canadian Press. Your line is open. Uh, my question is regarding uh, what you folks are talking about off the top about drone activity. Have firefighting aircraft operations been affected in any way by drone activity in the region? Have you had to ground aircraft or pull them away from a specific area because of drones? Uh, thanks. It's Chad Morrison with Alberta Wildfire. Um, our standard protocol and process is that if there's an un, uh, unauthorized drone in an area or unauthorized aircraft, that will often ground portions of our fleet. Uh, we're still investigating kind of the reports that we had this morning of, of some of that work. Uh, uh, my understanding is that our, fight, our fleet is still flying at this point, and so either it's been quickly addressed and we've been able to identify it, or um, it's, uh, you know, the, the investigation is still ongoing. So uh, at this point, uh, we haven't grounded anything. Uh, our, fi our firefighters are still working in, at this point, but it is our standard process. So that's kind of why we we're talking about the key message today is that, you know, if uh, there's unauthorized flying in an area that poses a significant risk to our first responders, and we want folks to take uh, the utmost due care and attention when, uh, when they're out in the area uh, around the fire. So just to follow up, so this is more of a warning or you're trying to raise awareness more than uh, water bombers or helicopters haven't been called off an area because of drones? Yeah, I'd, I'd work, I'd, I don't have the exact details on the report that we have this morning, uh, but we're still looking into it. But my understanding is that we're still flying at this time. So, um, But yes, it's a, definitely a warning and definitely a caution from our perspective. Uh, um, impacts and consequences can be uh, very high, so we want to make sure that people are taking, the, uh, um, taking this uh, warning very seriously. Great. Operator, if you'll put through our next caller, please. And your next question comes from the line of Brianna Carson-Smith from CTV Edmonton. Your line is open. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I wanted to ask Scott, um, since this is sort of the largest neighborhood and uh, so many people are eligible to come back today, does that challenge you at all or does that change um, sort of how you look at this re-entry day today compared to um, any of the other zones that open? Uh it is a challenge, but that's why we've done so much detailed planning on this in conjunction with all of our stakeholders, uh, with the regional authorities. Uh, we, we know what the population is. We've planned for 40, uh, and we're capable of bringing all 40,000 people back uh, safely. Uh, but based on the figures we're seeing right now and the messaging that's gone out and the fact this is voluntary, we expect about half that number. And if they come back, I can assure you they will be, will, they'll be welcome in a very safe a manner and we'll get, expedite them into their homes as quickly and as safely as possible. And as a follow-up, Dickensfield is in this area. Is there any um, update on that investigation into that house explosion? 
Uh, I know uh, that, oh, the explosion from uh, uh, 10 days ago, I believe it was. I do not have the results of that explosion. I uh, know there was an investigation conducted. I don't have the results, but I'll get that answer for you. Thank you. Uh, great. Operator, if you'll put through our next caller, please. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Lydia Neufeld from CBC. Your line is open. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a question for Chad. Uh, back to drones, if you don't mind. Um, can you explain how drones would actually hamper first responders? Sure. Yeah, it's Chad with Alberta Wildfire. Um, when aircraft are flying in unauthorized airspace, um, uh, we are obviously uh, very, very concerned about it. Uh, drones, the issue with them is that they're not radio controlled, they're not flight followed. Uh, there are uh, authorized drone operators that uh, get their Transport Canada licenses and have the appropriate certificates and authorizations. And so, you know, there's a particular process with that. Um, anybody that wants to do uh, uh, flying has to do flying. Uh, they're working through the process through the REOC. And then obviously the airspace over top of the fire is... Uh, um, uh, de designated as restricted uh, and there's a notice to all airmen, uh, no TAM in place. Um, the big issue for us then is oh, if there's uncontrolled aircraft flying, we have over 75 helicopters flying on that fire and there are times when we've had over 27 air tankers uh, plus all their support aircraft. It's an incredibly busy airspace. It's you know as busy as any city airport would be. So um, when there's folks that are out there flying uh, that aren't known and there's no um, check-in and the top proper procedures in place, uh, it poses an extreme risk uh, to uh, firefighting resources or anybody flying in the area. So uh, that's why, you know, obviously we take these types of reports very, very seriously and we have very strict uh, procedures and policies in place when such things are reported. So your the concern is possible collisions, I'm guessing. Yes, for sure. Yeah, uh, you know, um, there's a, obviously there's a large uh, amount for fines and stuff like that. But uh, any time that there's uh, aircraft in the air in such a busy airspace, um, it's obviously one of our biggest concerns. Great operator, if you'll put through our next caller, please. Your next question comes from the line of Dean Bennett from the Canadian Press. Your line is open. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, I, I dr another drone question. Just following up on Lydia's then. Uh, just to give people a sense of how dangerous this can be, I assume that, I mean, these things are very small, but they can get caught up in the rotors, right? Is that kind of the danger here? Or they can get into the intake for the engines and stuff? Is that the concern with the drones? Also, uh, do you have a sense of how many you're seeing and, and why are you seeing them? Is, is this just, you know, residents trying to get some aerial footage of the fire? So, Chad, with Alberta Wildfire. So, uh, uh, can you repeat your first question there again? Uh, just uh, the dangers itself? It's exactly. What to give people a sense of why this is dangerous, yes. I assume it's because these things can get caught up in the rotors and that sort of thing. Yeah, it, yeah. From an aircraft perspective, uh, you know, anything that can get caught in the uh, caught up in air in the rotors uh, can cause damages. Can cause uh, uh, anything that. Um, you know, you know, it's not just a bird strike, right? It, it can be uh, quite serious uh, and cause aircraft to fail uh, in numerous areas. Um, and as to your question of the type of uh, folks that are using it or that, you know, we had one initial report. Often they're used for doing aerial photography and those types of things. Um, but there is authorized providers which actually can do that. Uh, it, the folks that have Transport Canada authorization. Uh, and so, um, you know, those, there's a process for that and there has to be an authorization to that. I don't want to speak too much on behalf of sort of the, the rules and regulations that apply from um, the Transport Canada, but um, I do want to say that uh, it's something that all fire agencies take very seriously and all aircraft agencies take, uh, the aircraft folks take very seriously, simply because um, um, the consequences can be dire, right? And, and so uh, there's no... There's no margin or room for error here. We're talking about aircraft safety. You know, it's fine if a drone gets destroyed uh, or broken, you know, but, you know, you can't replace people's lives if they're flying out in, in these aircraft. So that's why we're just asking people to, to stay away from uh, using those devices at this time. So just to clarify, you're still investigating what you believe is just uh, drones up there trying to get some footage of the, uh, of the fire? Yeah, we're just looking into it at this point and there's an ongoing investigation and once we have the results of that we can, we'll work through our partner agencies as to kind of the protocols and procedures there as how that'll be applied. Great. Operator, if you'll put through our next caller, please. Your next question comes from the line of Dan Healing from the Canadian Press. Your line is open. Um, Dan Healy, your line is open. All right, maybe we'll move on to our next caller, please, operator. Thank you. And your next question comes from the line of Rick Dolphin from Inside Into Government. Your line is open. 
Uh, hi, just uh, I have a couple of questions for Chad. <clears throat> uh, first, um, in terms of uh, the fire moving into Saskatchewan, uh, are any of those uh, small settlements in Saskatchewan, such as Ducharme Lake um, or La Loche, threatened by this fire, or is it moving north of that? So, yeah, Chad Morrison with Alberta Wildfire. Uh, we're talking with the uh, folks from Saskatchewan, the representative there yesterday. Um, uh, he's, we have uh, folks embedded with the team, and they have, I believe, uh, a number of firefighters employed there. So you have to touch base with the agency there as to for the details. But no concerns from uh, my understanding at this time, and they can kind of provide you a bit more detail. Uh, again, with a bunch of rain we've had on the fire in the last number of uh, days here, and we expect uh, some continued uh, cooler weather over the next day or two, the fire is still holding, and, and uh, my understanding is that it's quite far away from any community at this time. So no concerns, but I would also uh, defer that you uh, touch base with the Saskatchewan folks there. Yeah, okay, fine. My, and my other question concerns uh, Fort McMurray. Uh, I was talking to a, a, a former firefighter there, and he, he said that there, uh, there has been or there had been a fire break uh, around the town uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, the city had, uh, for various reasons, not properly maintained, and that that uh, exacerbated the situation when the fire came to Fort McMurray. Uh, any uh, any truth to that? So yeah, I have a couple of comments to help uh, help with that uh, response. Uh, um uh, so one, the, the, let's talk about the fire conditions to start with. So the fire itself uh, jumped the Athabasca River, which is basically the, one of the best fire breaks you can actually have. It's a, you know, up to a kilometer wide in places of water. So you can't really beat a fire break like that. So when you're dealing with these types of extreme fire conditions that you have here, no fire break would have prevented this fire from entering in the community given the conditions and the hot weather and the high winds we had that day. That being said, I do want to give credit to the, to the region municipality, Wood Buffalo and Fort McMurray. Uh, for a number of years, uh, we've worked closely with them over the last, I would say, 20 years, um, uh, working on uh, fire smart activities, fire prevention mitigation stuff. So there was a bunch of ongoing work that has occurred. Um, again, you know, when you have these extreme events and these situations, uh, all those, uh, all that fire work, that fire smart work and the fire vegetation mitigation work, what it does is it gives firefighters a fighting chance. It's not going to prevent the fire, the main fire front from coming into impact in the community, but it does give them a chance to, you know, uh, retain and, and hold some of the structures in which they did. So I think, uh, you know, a lot of that is a credit to the firefighters are there, but they've done some good prevention and mitigation work over the years that we're familiar with. So, uh, again, very good uh, cooperative relationship there. As to the fire guard that the firefighters were uh, um, referring to, uh, there's been fires in the past that have threatened Fort McMurray many years ago, uh, so fire guards were built. Um, you know, if, like I said, if a single fire guard is not going to be the best solution. It's going to be a bigger holistic approach to vegetation management and fire smart work so that it makes your whole community safe from a whole perspective. So Fort McMurray has been doing that for a number of years. So uh, again, I think that's a lot of credit to the community why, you know, there was only 10% of homes impacted versus, you know, much more. Great. I think we'll take uh, one last call from the line operator. Your last question comes from the line of Dan Healing from the Canadian Press. Your line is open. Uh, good morning. I, I just had a quick question about uh, private restoration companies that are coming into town to help uh, private homeowners and, uh, and small businesses start up. Are there any restrictions on them? And, and a secondary question, what is the situation with regard to particulate matter in in the air inside these buildings? Is there any danger from that? Uh, to answer your first question, so uh, the recovery, uh, the re-entry piece and the recovery aspects of Fort McMurray are all being driven uh, through the regional authority supported by the government. They are committed to uh, hiring and contracting locally, so that's the first thing. Uh, there is right now no private companies doing any restorations, if you will. Uh, because we're still at the early stages of re-entry. People are going back, uh, working with their insurance providers, and I'm sure that that work uh, will occur uh, in the uh, days, weeks, months ahead. Uh, with regards to um, um, uh, some of the small businesses, uh, my understanding, and uh, I can get confirmation from the regional authority, a lot of the small businesses used uh, local residents, local employees, uh, local workforces to restock the shelves. Uh, that is uh, the, uh, the truth on the ground is that they are committed uh, to employing uh, local contractors, local people who have been impacted by the economy first and foremost for everything. Uh, the second question, could you just repeat that, sir, please? Um, yeah, I was wondering about uh, air quality inside buildings uh, like small businesses and houses. Is there any danger from particulate matter? All of the samples tested to date 
uh, have determined uh, uh, no uh, um, uh, uh, issues in terms of asbestos particulates or, or anything in the air. Air quality uh, uh, is a, an issue or has been. Uh, today it's one. I believe it's lower than Edmonton today. Uh, and we continue to monitor that. Uh, I think if you remember, the chief medical officer's recommendations did advise people uh, when they did go into their uh, residence that they should wear uh, some proper uh, protective uh, equipment, personal protective equipment, uh, N95 masks, long sleeve shirts, uh, gloves. That is positive safety, uh, just to make sure when you go on in and that you are uh, doing your cleanup uh, that you, wanna, uh, you are, are, are not exposed to anything. But right now, all of our testing uh, has determined no uh, threat at all. Great. If there's nothing further from the floor, okay. Thank you very much.